I've got a friend called David, David Lincoln, who works in the north of England, um, and he's a nurse, and when he goes round on his ward rounds, he says to patients, are you having a good time? And he says it's because he expects that even, especially when people are in hospital, um, they should have excellent customer service um, and personalised personalised care. Um, my name's Jim. I work with an organisation called Opening Doors London. Um, eventually, we'll probably get rid of the London. We're doing a lot of work outside of London, but we provide services in London. I'm going to speak for about two or three minutes, not more, about the services we provide, because if you've not come across us and you're interested in supporting older LGBT people in terms of health, then there might be some of our services that you might want to access. I'm then going to pick up and share with you some research of our own um, and research of other uh, organisations, especially, um, I was not here unfortunately this morning, I was at another event, but especially Stonewall's Unhealthy Attitudes Survey, which was referenced this morning, but I think it's particularly uh, prescient for the work that we're involved in at the moment. Um, let me remind me what my slides are. Let's have a look what to do, sorry. Okay. So we work with older LGBT people. Old is pretty broad. We say 50 plus. I'm 58, 59 shortly. Um, this year I've started to go bold. I'm very self-conscious about that. Um, and I'm losing my sight. Um, and I've started to use, use glasses. So, but I'm not as old as a lot of the people we work with. A lot of the people we work with are in their 70s and their 80s. So these are people who grew up LGBT in the 1950s, 1960s, 19, 1970s. Um, a more hostile environment. Briefly, we connect with, it's going up all the time, I think it's now near 2,000 older LGBT people in London, most of them in their 70s and their 80s. We provide groups and social activities across London. Almost all of them are free. Some of them are a cost, but I'd say about 90, 95% probably are free. Um, some of it's really simple. In the building that I share with Age UK, in our basement we have got a cafe. Two or three times a week people come in and they play traditional games like drafts and whist and, and things like that. And we get about 50, 60 people coming along there. They say they like it because they feel safe. It's advertised as LGBT. They don't need to talk about being LGBT, I mean, it rarely comes up, but they just feel it's a nice environment. We do a lot of that throughout London. Um, we also, when we come across people who are older and they're more fragile, they're not able to get out and about as much, or maybe are fearful of going out and about um, because they don't know what might happen to them, uh, we provide specialised befriending services. Um, Anyone can refer to our service. Um, we have lots of volunteers. There are younger people, mostly LGBT, not all. Some heterosexual people who enjoy the work and we really welcome anyone coming involved in the, in the programme. I'll give you a recent example. This is, well, recent, six months ago, but it's funny to me. I was watching um, Talking Pictures TV, sad man that I am, uh, a few weeks ago, an old Betty Davis film. We've matched a young actor who's 23 years old. He's a young actor in London with an 85-year-old guy who used to work in Hollywood. And if you go to his council flat, he's got a whole wall of his council flat with wigs. He was a wig maker. And he has Betty Davis's wig that he made for Betty Davis um, and things like that. So we try to match younger people who've got an interest that matches the older LGBT people so they've got something to talk about. We provide training, which I'll come on to talk about, and we have a quality standard. We have, there are only two major quality standards, I would say, in terms of LGBT practice in the UK. One is called Pride in Practice, very specific, very medical, and very based on GP surgeries. We have Pride in Care, which is about anyone working broadly in care. Care homes, domiciliary care, but a lot of agencies like the HUKs who provide support for older people. Why is it important? Because it was tough then. Yeah? And we are really standing on the shoulders of giants who suffered. I was talking to a woman before Christmas who's about 85, when in the 1960s she and her girlfriend were in Soho, they went off the beaten track, they were surrounded by a gang of lads. Um, she still blames herself for the fact that they went down a route that she thought would get away from it, and they got stuck in some kind of a dead alley. Her girlfriend was kicked to death. 
in front of her. Yeah? Now, she's still here, and she seems to me a rather robust, strong, confident woman. That's why she's involved in Open Doors London. But you're not going to get over that, are you? That's going to be some kind of a, a trauma. So the light, the, still things happen now. There was something in the Evening Standard only a month ago about uh, a young gay guy who had some kind of insignia like this that, that, that suggested LGBT, who some guy came over to him and, and hit him in the face and called him all sorts of names. So it still happens now. But the hostile climate of the people who grew up in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, um, who we are responsible for, who we have a duty of care for, um, are, are, are here with us now. What I want to do in the next 10 minutes is explain why, through research, we know that we lack confidence in working with older LGBT people on the whole. And we lack training through our own professional training and, and development. Um, and I'm doing that very deliberately to say that we are one of a number of organisations who provide training uh, around these subjects. Just a couple of comments, I'm not going to spend time on this. Um, we lived under a stone, the only time we'd hug and kiss would be behind drawn curtains. We grew up in fear and dread of the knock on the door at 6am. In those early days, you were frightened the police could do what they wanted and nobody would complain. Really like the presentation from police earlier um, and uh, the internal training that's been done, even around banter, which is, which is an issue. So we have come a long, long way. But at that time, if you went to the police, you would not be treated very well. I was referred to my GP for psychiatric treatment. So medicalisation. It's not that long ago when to be LGBT was a classified mental health illness. You were wrong. You needed to be fixed. You were the problem. We're moving towards the change in that. But think about the people of this age range. They grew up in this time. They have lived in this time. People with dementia may be actively, most of the time, circling their thoughts around what it was like 50 years ago. So it is relevant. Of course it's important. I was talking to some people in the care home recently who said they'd been inspected, Care Quality Commission, and for the first time they'd been asked about LGBT. In the past they'd been asked about equality, but they were asked, what are you doing to engage with and support your older LGBT people? And the person I was speaking to told me, she was a care home manager, she said, but we treat everybody equally. And I said, that's not good enough. It's not good enough. It's a great foundation. There are differences between LGBT people and heterosexual people. You know, that might seem controversial, but, but there are. But this particular older generation, coming from where they've come from, there are a lot of things that we need to take into account. And our training currently does not provide that information. I'm going to just spend about a minute on each of these topics which are important to our organisation this year. Um, and then I'll take a couple of questions at the end if, if people have got questions. Why are we different? The older generation of LGBT people tend not to have children. It's obvious if you think about it, but they tend not to. That means they don't have grandchildren, they don't have nephews and nieces often. They do not have family support in the way that their heterosexual peers do. There's an issue about support, which is quite different for this older generation of LGBT people. My partner James, civil partnership ceremony some time ago, looks like he's deciding whether he wants to go through with the ceremony. I said it just looked like you're having a moment of, of thought. I'm in the background. So we're typical. I'm uh, late 50s, 58, 59 nearly. James is nearly 65. We don't have children. Um, but also, like many older LGBT people, we're, we're estranged from our families. Not saying everybody, but a lot of the older generation are... The shame, the shame, in 1950, 1960, 1970, let alone 1980, which is my kind of generation coming along, uh, for your family to say that you were, if you're, you know, you want to come out, you want to be who you are, but to come out and then have the shame of your family. So particularly this older generation were rejected. You know? We're spat on in the street. We're violently attacked in the street. They live with that. They do not forget that. That's part of that. You need to be aware of that. Yeah? Everything. Changing legislation is brilliant. It does not mean changing attitudes you know, and behaviours of people. So we need to think about that. So yeah, I'm just recognising me and my partner. Um, looking ahead, in terms of health, well, one of us is going to get ill at some stage and the other will be their prime carer and will love and care the best we can. 
And then when we're left alone, most older LGBT people are single. When we're left alone, we're, we are at the mercy of you. We're at the mercy of health, social care, other kinds of, of, of services, because we do not have the kind of family backup and, and bank that your heterosexual peers will have. So it's concerning. I'm going to come through these quite briefly, but mental health, higher levels of mental health, and we might think that some of this is related to the trauma, we're thinking about this older age group, the trauma that people went through, having to suppress identity, having to live double lives, actually being physically attacked, assaulted, verbally assaulted in, in the streets. High level of alcohol. We know that older people are drinking more alcohol, and that's a concern generally. Older LGBT people drink more alcohol than heterosexual people. We haven't got time to explore that, but we might think some of the reasons why alcohol can, can be used. And safety and security, you know? If, like Joe, you saw your girlfriend kicked to death a long time ago, you always are aware that you might be kicked to death. Imagine when you get older and you're more... I feel pretty... The last time I was attacked by... Just because of being gay, a gay man was about 12 years ago. I was walking down the street with my partner, arm around my partner. A jogger came running past us. We thought, as he came past, he hit me in the eye. And I had to go to hospital. And I didn't know, because I was so shocked at the time, I didn't hear anything, but he said, faggot. Which is a strange word. I, thought, I didn't know people said that anymore. But, yeah, but, it was a, but it was a word. It was a clear assault. Um, but think if you're 80, how you feel, if you're alone, which is the main profile of this age group of LGBT people. We work with people in terms of our befriending schemes who only go out to the shops when they need to, to get food. Huge difference to their lives if they've got a befriender, somebody who gets into a relationship with them, works with them closely, and will literally go out with them. And gradually, what we find is a number of the people who we go out with will gradually build their confidence and they'll start to go out themselves, they'll jo join groups and activities. But to get out the door is tough because if, again, low support, no family, often people are on their own. So it's, it's a scary world out there. Gallup saying four and five. I, I mean, some of you will be aware of the largest survey, 100,000 people survey, just over 100,000 people by the Equalities Office just last July. Uh, I think, I, I'm not going to check, actually, maybe I should check it. I think it was two-thirds of respondents said they avoid holding hands with a same-sex partner for fear of negative reactions. And two in five people in the year before this survey, two in five, had actually experienced serious verbal harassment or violence because of that situation. So that's why they don't. We think, you look around the room, you can't see culture very well. It happens in behaviours. We look around the room, we think it's a nice place, it's a nice town wherever we're living. Um, but some people will not show affection because they fear that they will be turned on by the people around them. But again, ratchet that up. Imagine people who went through really serious violence when there was no legislation, when police were not interested in, in what happened. So, this results in... We haven't got time to look at the research in detail, but if anybody wants to get in contact or share research with you, some of it is by our own people who do the research. Um, there's a lack of confidence with LGBT people in health and social care services. There's less... Oh, that's a terrible thing to happen. <coughs> Hi, sorry, I can't speak. We're in a conference. <laughs> We're talking about LGBT issues. I hope you're comfortable with that. Catch you later. Um, Older people are an invisible and marginalised population. Um, and this relates particularly to care homes and domiciliary care that we're working with at the moment. We're trying to get care homes and domiciliary care to up their game. If you move into care, when you're alone, when you don't have family, what often happens is people, using the old phrase, go back into the closet. They may have actually lived for a while open about who they are and their identity. And in, and in your, your last years, when you're making your peace with death, to have to deny who you are 
It's a, it's a terrible thing. But there's a huge amount of educational work to be done in, in care homes and, and domiciliary care for single old LGBT people. LGBT people are twice as likely as heterosexual peers to rely on health and care, but most say their carers don't understand their needs. This is the most important document that I've come across uh, in several years around the issue. Some of you know it already. Unhealthy Attitudes, if you Google it, it's still on Stonewall's website. I use it whenever anybody says to me, actually, somebody said to me uh, before Christmas, um, oh, you've got it all now. You've got it all now. I think that was meant to say that, that uh, this person's view of myself as a gay man was gay men having a hedonistic lifestyle and now they've got the law behind them and they've got the government behind them. This says that there are real health in inequalities still um, and it's a powerful document. I'm just going to pick up two or three points from this document. So th yeah, briefly, 3,001 3, people, um, doctors, nurses, social workers, care workers, quite a wide range. Okay, not 3 million but 3,000, it's not, it's not 300, it's quite a big sample. Some prejudice, this is my favourite. In my opinion, the, the needs of others that are not the norm should not be forced on those who have chosen to be what we up till now considered mainstream normal. And then a scientific argument. As human beings, we are biologically programmed to function in a certain manner and deviations, in my view, are not to be considered mainstream society. And that's a doctor. And that's not 30 years ago, that's two and a half years ago, three years ago, I think, yeah? And if there's one person who feels confident and arrogant enough to actually say that in response, there are other people. Yeah? But the research kind of says that, although of course prejudice continues, it's more, we would say, about a lack of confidence. So six in ten said they didn't consider LGBT to be at all relevant, we think it is, and in certain kinds of diagnosis it, it is particularly relevant. One in ten said that while it may be relevant, they didn't feel confident to meet the specific needs of LGBT people, and also a quarter said they weren't able to respond to specific needs of trans people. Um, Jacob Lyons, as he was then, and he's allowed me to tell this story, um, is, was the son of my best friend Andrew, and um, I looked after him one day a week growing up. I don't have children myself. It's my only regret as a gay man. If I'd been a gay man growing up now, I'd want to build a family. That'd be very important to me. But at the time, it just wasn't really an option uh, for me. But I looked after Jacob growing up. When he was 17 or 18, he came out as gay. And that was interesting. And we had lots of interesting conversations about that. About three or four years later, when I was meant to be seeing him at Christmas, he said, um, by the way, something I need to tell you, I'm living with a woman. I said, fine not an issue, we just got on, we had the usual meal, um, and a couple of years ago he began transitioning. The fluidity of this area is extraordinary, and the confidence that mostly younger people, for all sorts of reasons, including the internet, being able to actually talk to other people, see other people, telling about their lives, is making a vast change. This, I mean, we haven't got time to talk about it. this is fascinating. Really, I think about a third of the people uh, in this 100,000 people define themselves as bisexual in different ways. Uh, and we haven't begun to think about where all this is going to go. But anyway, if you happen to, the reason why I think about that is, if you were at Sasha uh, going to see a consultant as a trans person and you have a very bad experience and you leave thinking, I'm not quite sure when, what went on there, but it didn't feel like a good consultation to me, it might be you were one of the one in four who got the person who doesn't know anything about trans. It just happens to be your consultant for the day. Yeah? Huge education around trans issues within the NHS, which is being started, but it's really only being started. But I go back to confidence. It's mostly about confidence. In the work that I do, I go out with teams of people. There are two or three people here today. Hello, Maggie. Can you give me a wave? I didn't know Maggie was coming. Um, Maggie, and uh, we've got a number of people, three or four people uh, who've come with me. We, we go out as teams. We don't go out as a, a, a lesbian or a gay man. We go out LGBT, and we train groups of staff. So at the end of the training, they have had to engage and have quite detailed conversations with a lesbian, a gay man, a bisexual person, and a trans person. And in the evaluations, uniformly people said that was the most important thing. I thought I was doing the right thing, but to actually have the time 
to really interrogate it with people like you really makes me now feel stronger and more confident. People fear political correctness gone mad. They fear saying the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing. So very briefly, the wonderful thing is, by the way, in, in the survey, uh, staff said they hadn't been trained. It wasn't part of the professional education and they had very little ongoing professional education. But this is all training. And the wonderful thing is confidence is, is trainable. If you get people in the room who kind of know what they're doing, but just need a little bit more upping the ante, um, they can feel more confident to go out. And then that will ripple out within their own staff teams, their own colleagues, the work that they're doing for, for patients. I'm not going to linger on that other than to say that people report that when we go out as a team, there you are Maggie, um, when we go out as a team talking with people, um, it's the fact that we go out as teams that makes a big difference. We deal with research, the latest research in showing that, we deal with policy and the law, so everybody's aware of the legal requirements, but the most important thing is it's personal, and people will get an opportunity to actually talk directly with LGBT people about improving the quality of health and social care. In summary, older LGBT people lack support because most of them don't have family. Therefore, they rely on health and social care prof professionals much more than their heterosexual peers. But social care professionals themselves and health professionals say they lack confidence and they haven't had sufficient training. We need to train our staff. Thank you.